Lads, the struggle will be against all odds, but cheer up and have courage. Those were the immortal last words of Arturo Pratt as he fought the uh, Huskar. Uh, uh, and I apologize to my friend uh, Fernando. Uh, I, I learned German in college, not Spanish. So uh, I'm going to struggle with some of the name pronunciation, but I apologize. Now, uh, this is a little-known conflict that uh, followed upon the, uh, whoopsie, uh, uh, followed upon the, uh, what is known as the Guano Wars. Spain tried to reassert its authority along the coast of Chile and Peru and Bolivia, uh, trying to regain their colonies. Uh, that strategy did not work very well for Spain. However, you know, the borders between Chile and Peru and Bolivia were always um, contested uh, because they were Spanish colonies and no real dividing line had been created. And so uh, when the uh, uh, islands uh, that uh, produce uh, guano uh, were under dispute, so were other areas along the coast. Most importantly, I would say the Atacam Desert, um, which I mispronounced, and uh, so, um, but there are going to be two naval powers on the uh, Pacific coast. One is Peru, and the other will be Chile. And uh, the Chileans seem to buy all their ironclads from Great Britain. Sadly for Peru, they bought some from England, but some from the United States. And so this is going to be the last time we're going to see ironclads fight other ironclads. Very quickly, we're going to go into steel ship construction, which uh, is better and uh, gives greater speed. Also, the armaments are going to be stronger. Um, so this is, this war is the highest level of ironclad design based on the Civil War experience. And the resulting naval armor clads in Europe will start to change as a result of this war. So, um, okay. So uh, this is uh, a, um, uh, one of the uh, um, Spanish, uh, excuse me, uh, the Peruvian ships uh, that are going to uh, be purchased. It's called a central battery, and you can see uh, amidships how the central battery is built. It is uh, 4.5 inches of armor, and within those central batteries, there would be three 300-pounder Armstrong guns, and those are probably of, you know, iron-made guns. They are the height. In other words, they would be basically nine-inch guns, uh, and they would use what is called a pallister shell, uh, which was uh, an armor-piercing shell that uh, was used. Uh, the first armor-piercing shell was, of course, the brook bolt, but it did not work as well as the pallister shell. And uh, I just want to say that is the Oscar. Uh, I'm getting close. And you can see the hole in the turret. And that is caused by a pallister shell. Um, and so um, anyway, uh, so um, this building up to the war, um, Great Britain becomes probably the major producer of ironclads for the world. And this is the uh, uh, Huskar, uh, Huskar um, and uh, uh, you can see it is in essence what's called a lard ram. It is built by the lard brothers in uh, uh, Liverpool, actually Birkenhead across the river from Liverpool. Uh, but you can see uh, that number one, it can get to 12 knots. Uh, number two, it's very seaworthy. It goes from Great Britain around Cape Horn, 
uh, to Peru. Uh, so it's seaworthy, unlike American monitors. And it also has what is called a Coles turret. Now, there are several types of turrets. We all think about John Erickson and his turret, uh, but his turret worked on a spindle that turned it. Um, Cowper Coles will develop a turret that actually has a cylinder that goes down into the ship, which gives it greater stability and ability to turn. And sadly, uh, many of the Peruvian sailors who are on this ship uh, during its first combat don't know really how to work it. And uh, so it kind of tells you that the War of the Pacific at first was fought between armies that were not prepared to fight. Now, um, during the uh, uh, Guano Wars, the Chinchilla Islands, which has took place beginning in 1864, um, Eventually, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile allied themselves against the Spanish. And um, basically, they are going to um, be able to defeat Spain. Spain just does not have enough resources to bring to the uh, Pacific. They are going to be defeated in what is known as the Battle of Palputo, I believe, and again in the Battle of Cal Lacar. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> and as a result of this conflict, both Peru and Chile started to build a navy. Now, I have to tell you, Bolivia, which then had a narrow section of coastline, never even thought the need to build a navy. Their two neighbors are going to control what's happening. Now, um, this is, of course, the Oscar uh, and... Uh, uh, I, what I like about it is that it's fast, it's seaworthy, um, it has 10-inch guns on it. Those are 300-pounder Armstrongs. And they actually had two Armstrong guns in the turret. They also had one at the forecastle, 12-pounder um, Armstrong gun, but they also had two 44 caliber Gatling guns you know, to with spell borders and so forth. Um, the uh, other style of ship we're going to see, this is a real great view of what makes uh, a central battery uh, vessel. Uh, and you can see where the central battery is, and you can see the guns that are not in pivot, but they are, have a wide arc of fire, and as a result of that, uh, this makes this type of ship probably the superior ironclad of the ironclad era. This is the Independencia. Uh, no? Oops, oh, it's Admiral Cochrane. Um, and uh, this is going to uh, be built um, by the uh, Samuda brothers in Poplar, London. Um, it is, of course, Admiral Cochrane was a famous British admiral who actually was uh, fired from the Royal Navy because of a stock scandal in 1815. And so he's a guy that likes to fight, so he joins the Chilean Navy and helps them win their independence. Um, so this is, uh, takes 250 men to operate the ship um, and uh, um, it is a, a fairly powerful uh, vessel. Now, ah, here we go. This is actually the USS Catawba. Uh, it's built uh, up in St. Louis. Uh, it's fitted with sails. If you remember your history, Erickson was supposed to put sails on the monitor. He said you didn't need them. But this ship had to go around Cape Horn to make it to... Um, Peru, uh, and basically it is armed with uh, two 15-inch Dahlgren guns. It's a Kenneklaas monitor. It will be named at uh, Hupa, uh, I think, <laughs> and, and he was the last emperor of the Inca Empire. The Wuskar was his brother, 
And so, uh, and that's why they're Peruvian ships. Um, now this has a, a screw propulsion. Um, the two masts are help it to get around the horn. Um, and uh, it, they, they keep the, um, the mass on board the vessel um, throughout the, uh, um, throughout the, what we'll call the War of the Pacific. Now, um, the, you know, what I like about the Admiral Cochrane is that uh, it has not only very powerful rifles, it also has a new style of gun built on the model of the Gatling gun known as the Northfelt gun, uh, which is a rapid fire one inch uh, gun. And so there, once again, they worry about boarding and so forth. Um, the sister ship to the Admiral Cochrane is going to know as Blanco and Shalada. I think. <laughs> I'm butchering this and I apologize. I should have taken a, a course in Spanish before I did this. Now, what are the causes of this war? Now, you can see they're building up their forces because um, there is all these great natural resources in the coastline, uh, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. And that's mostly in what is known as the Atacam Desert. Um, and uh, they have the major product out of there is going to be nitrate uh, and to make it's also this war is also going to be called the Saltpeter War. So um, the control of that saltpeter is, is very important to Chile and Peru as well as Bolivia. But Bolivia has a very weak army. They do not have a navy. And so the forces of Chile have business interests that uh, are also related to uh, British business interests, um, try to control the mining of the nitrates. And Peru says, no, we need to have a part of it. And Bolivia says, oh, no, uh, we want part of it. So it's domestic. Um, it, it, it's also economic and it's geopolitical because this saltpeter, as you know, is a very critical uh, material to create gunpowder, etc. Now, the desert uh, was really claimed all by Chile, and this goes back to the Spanish Empire, and so Chile claims it, and they're going to want to go get it. Bolivia and Peru sign a secret alliance, right? In, uh, and so they uh, were, are ready for war. Nobody really is ready for war. Other than the ironclads they have bought, there is no general staff. There's no, f you know, the armies are disorganized. In fact, Chile has an army numbering 2,500 men. And so it's going to enlarge very quickly during this war. Um, and uh, everyone thought in Europe that Chile was going to be defeated uh, and they're going to be proven wrong. The key to victory in this war is going to be um, the uh, actually control of the sea. That's going to enable uh, whoever wins the sea battles is going to enable them to be able to move up and down the coast. And this is critical. So uh, uh, basically, control of the sea is going to decide the war in Chile's favor. Uh, now, this is uh, the Atacama Desert, um, now part of Chile, but that's where you get saltpeter from and other minerals of great importance. And so it's hard to believe they're fighting over this territory. But it is critical uh, for um, uh, the economic well-being of Chile. There is a book written by Joseph Conrad, El Supremo, and it's about this war. And uh, when individual crosses this desert to gain reinforcements uh, uh, for the Chileans and uh, 
Uh, so it's a great film, anyway. Well, there's a film. It's a good book. Uh, oh, my gosh. Here is the Oscar. Uh, I got it right that time, I think. Uh, and uh, you can see those, that forward mast is called a Coles mast. So he develops it. So guess what's up at the top? A Gatling gun. So, you know, it's a dangerous place. This is the interior of the Admiral Cochran. This is the central battery. Look how huge those guns are. And when you think about it, this, this style of gun is going to, you can see how it's triple banded, but also this style of gun is going to evolve into the heavy uh, rifled guns that you're going to see built in the 1880s. So this is the last of its kind. And in fact, well, so anyway, so the Oscar is going to break out of the port of, oh my gosh, help me, um, the port of in Kurik, in what? In Kike, thank you. <laughs> Gotta have help. Uh, and, and so basically, um, the, Colum uh, the Chileans are blockading this port. Um, Inquique will eventually be part of Chile, but this shows the Huscar um, ramming a vessel known as the Emredela. Um, and, and so it is commanded by Arturo Pratt. Remember, Arturo Pratt uh, is this outstanding officer, and he knows he's going up against an ironclad, but he tells his men uh, that, uh, lads, the struggle will be against the odds, but cheer up and have courage. Never has our flag been hauled down in the face of the enemy, and I hope, thus, this will not be the occasion to do so. For my part, as long as I live, this flag will fly in its place, and if I should die, my officers shall have to fulfill their duties in my place. Now, when the Oscar rams the um, uh, Chilean ship, it's a British-built corvette, uh, and, and these are fast steamers uh, meant to actually be raiders, and the Huskar actually is fighting and behind this naval battle is actually going to be the port of uh, in uh, Inkike, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's practically sehr good Deutsch, you know, what can I say? <laughs> so anyway, the second time the Oscar rams uh, the Corvette, they will actually, Arturo Pratt will yell to his men just what I said, and over the din of battle, only one person heard it. So when Arturo Pratt jumps on the vessel, he is followed by one petty officer, and the petty officer is mortally wounded, and Pratt, of course, is killed. Um, and this breaks down the uh, defenses of um, the uh, Peruvian ship, and as a result of that, um, it uh, will um, uh, it will cause a major defeat. Now, while this is all going on, uh, we realize that uh, Pratt had ordered a transport Lamar uh, to retreat to the south, and it is going to be followed by another smaller corvette known as the Covadonga, uh, and it is going to be chased by the Chilean Independencia. Uh, the Oscar had focused on this ship, and so the Independencia is going to. Now, it's the, the Corvette is faster. The Independencia is, of course, uh, an ironclad, and you can see uh, uh, there it is. This is uh, the best ironclad uh, in the Peruvian Navy. It is a frigate style, not central battery. Uh, so basically, uh, this is built in France, uh, which is another problem. And so what will happen is that it chases down uh, the uh, um, uh, Cordovia and 
basically trying to get inside the uh, Peruvian wooden ship, uh, the uh, or the Peruvian, that's Chilean, the one to the right is, of course, uh, uh, Peruvian. This is one of their major ironclads. It will hit a submerged rock and it will sink. Uh, and basically, uh, the Wuskar will come up and pick up, uh, they take the guns off the ship and they also rescue part of the crew. Uh, I've got to tell you, um, this is disastrous for uh, Peru. Uh, now, the Peruvians um, will uh, uh, basically um, be only having one ironclad able to really operate at sea. Now, up near, uh, uh, in Peru, of course, uh, near Lima, they have uh, these two monitors but they are not considered seaworthy enough. So basically, the Peruvians have only the Huscar, Huscar to defend uh, its uh, life. So here, this is the battle. Now, for six months, the Huscar is going to be able to uh, raid and cause like Chilean transports to be captured in the Straits of Magellan. Uh, and this is commanded by Miguel Graw, who's known as the Gentleman of the Seas. Now, uh, basically, the uh, weak point of the Huscar is going to be its uh, stern, uh, because it has limited armament there, and you can't use your turret to fire. Uh, so the uh, Admiral Cochran will approach the ship at its stern and send shots into it. I have to tell you, um, Grau uh, realized that he could only win by ramming, uh, but he can't get into position to do so. And the end result is going to be that the 300 pounder shells from uh, the Admiral Cochrane are going to be devastating to the Oscar. Um, and uh, uh, even though that ship had defied the Chilean Navy, now it's trapped um, because uh, this is going to be uh, um, a tragic battle for the, uh, uh, basically, um, the Peruvians. Uh, the Oscar was shelled by over two hours uh, by Admiral Cochrane. And the very first shot, a palister shell, pierced the turret and exploded inside. And that uh, basically uh, killed 12 sailors and disabled one of the guns. And the next shot fired is going to pierce um, the officer's quarters near the stern Actually, it explodes inside, breaks the steering chains, and so the Huscar can only go in a circle, all right? So it can't steer itself until they repair it. As soon as they repair it, another shot hits and breaks it again. Now, that first shot that exploded is going to kill um, Miguel Grau. And Grau is, uh, uh, they, um, will later say they only found his hand in his foot. So uh, you can just see the devastation of this type of shell. Now, uh, basically, uh, the Huscar becomes adrift, and uh, uh, once the temporary repairs are made, another shot passes through and breaks the steering mechanisms again. And, you know, these uh, palister shells, and, and the ship in the f background is known as the Blanco and Cal Ada. Um, and uh, basically, that too joins in the fray. So you have two central battery ironclads palmating the Oscar. And the Oscar is going to actually be able uh, to send some shots, but. Um, uh, basically, another shell hits the turret. You can see uh, in this painting a hole in the turret, 
right? That's caused by a pallister shell. Now, I have to tell you, uh, this uh, killed everyone inside. It knocked over uh, one of the Oscar's guns, and so the Oscar is unable to really defend itself. Uh, a Lieutenant Pedro Garzon assumed command of the ironclad, and he attempted to scuttle it because we refused to lower our flag. Now, that flag had been shot down. The um, Peruvians put it back up. It gets shot down again. They finally mount it with chains to the mast, and what's going to happen is, once again, it gets shot down. But the Peruvians never surrender. And that was the big thing that Miguel Grau had told them all. You know, we can't surrender. In fact, uh, I have to tell you that uh, Grau is, uh, as he's called, the um, gentleman of the seas. Um, he uh, will uh, basically, um, his, his message to his men are well thought. They tried to scuttle it uh, by damaging the condenser, and instead the Peruvians board the uh, Oscar, and they're able to capture it and stop it from being sunk. And uh, so this battle is what gives Chile the victory in the War of the Pacific. It goes on for several other years, but the bottom line is that this uh, is what enables Chile to move up and down the coast. They take over the Bolivian coast, and they take over part of the uh, Peruvian coast. And, and the maps today show you the extent of this victory. And actually, uh, Chile claimed much of Patagonia in uh, Argentina, but uh, they settled that differently. Um, uh, Chile uh, is... Um, is, is victorious in this battle, and economically, they become also victorious. Now, the big thing is, you know, I travel a lot, or used to, and uh, I have to say, I was, I was in uh, Quebec, and on a cruise ship, which I was lecturing on, and we docked, and when I got off the cruise ship, right in front of me, was a statue of Miguel Grau. I could not believe it. Uh, I then, okay, yes. Um, um, yeah, there he is. Um, he becomes the Grand Admiral of the Peruvian Navy. Uh, he is uh, fearless. Um, and uh, I have to tell you, uh, when he defeats Arturo Pratt, uh, he takes Arturo Pratt's body and he will save it with his sword and his medals and all his effects and send them to his wife with this letter that said, I have a sacred duty that authorized me to write despite knowing that this letter will deepen your profound pain by reminding you of recent battles. During the naval combat that took place in the waters of Nuke, uh, uh, between Chilean and Peruvian ships on the 21st day of last month, your worthy and valiant husband, Captain Arturo Pratt, commander of the Esmeralda, was, like you, would not ignore any longer, victim of his reckless valor in defense and glory of his country's flag. While sincerely deploring this unfortunate event and sharing your sorrow, I comply with the sad duty of sending you some of his belongings invaluable to you, which I will list at the end of this letter. Undoubtedly, they will serve a small constellation in the middle of your misfortune, and I have hurried in remitting, remitting them to you. Reiterating my feelings of condolence, I take this opportunity of offering my services, considerations, and respects and I render myself at your disposal. Uh, it is amazing, you know, to see that letter about an enemy uh, who Grau respected beyond all. In fact, uh, there is a monument to Grau uh, in Chile 
There's one in Peru. Actually, every time they had the Congress of Peru, they read a list of all the members, and included in that list is Grand Admiral Miguel Grau. Um, he uh, uh, is actually also in the roll call, ceremonious roll call of the Peruvian Navy. Guess who name is also mentioned? Miguel Grau. Uh, he is a tremendous symbol. I was given a lecture in Seattle, and uh, I was out, you know, walking in a park, and my gosh, there is a monument for Miguel Grau. <laughs> Who is this person? That's the first time I saw it, and then I learned. Um, you can well imagine that uh, the, the, the feat of the Huscar is tragic for the Peruvians uh, and as well as for Miguel Grau. But he becomes a symbol of, uh, of the Peruvian Navy and also of her um, uh, heroism. Now, I got to tell you, there still is a navy left after the defeat of the Huascar. And there is the Manco Capa, Capac. Uh, that is the UNITA, USS UNITA. And basically, uh, it, it's built up the Mississippi and, at the, and it's commissioned at the very end of the war. So the navy doesn't need it and they tell the builder, well, even though we paid for it, you get to have it back. And so the Swift brothers are, are good salesmen, I guess, and they approached the Peruvians and said, don't you want to have a monitor? And so uh, they will plan to sell it to Peru. Now, believe it or not, that uh, the government will pay, U.S. government will pay the Swift brothers $375,000 for their losses in taking back the, uh, uh, the ironclad, both ironclads, Catawba and the Anita. And then they turn around and sell the ships to Peru for $1 million. So these guys, you know, you think there's some graft going on today. Uh, let me just tell you, it was going on during, right after the Civil War. Uh, and these ships never see any active service. Actually, the um, uh, Catawba will actually be towed out of uh, the harbor and try to shell at a distance uh, Chilean ships, uh, but there's not much to it, and so it will be scuttled. Um, the other ship, the Anita, will actually uh, be scuttled, but they raise it and they use it as a barge until the 1930s. And so there goes the Peruvian Navy. Uh, now you can see uh, the border area where uh, Chile will uh, be able to gain. But really when we think of the War of the Pacific, it's a war about economic control of a mineral rich area. But more importantly, it also stands as a symbol of naval heroism. Miguel Graw is recognized throughout the world. I mean, his ship, the Huascar, was built in Birkenhead. And, and it's so amazing, you get off the boat, and there all of a sudden, who do you see? Miguel Graw. And, you know, I can't believe, I think there's five different monuments that uh, I have not seen two of them, but I've seen three of them. So I guess I have to go to Peru <laughs> to get my jollies um, about seeing ironclads. Uh, now, uh, the big thing is he becomes such a hero uh, that the ship he commanded is still afloat, believe it or not. This is a Huascar. Um, it is in Chile. Uh, the Chileans say, come on down, Peruvians, if you want to see your ship, but we got it. And uh, basically, uh, it has been restored in an excellent fashion. Now, if you've been to uh, Plymouth, England, you will see the HMS Warrior that gets commissioned in 1860. Uh, that is the oldest ironclad afloat. I have to tell you, they save it because it was turned into a coal barge, and someone says, well, that's the Warrior. And so they, they rebuilt it, and it's really pretty fabulous if you're into ironclads like I am. But the second oldest is going to be the Wiscar, and 
You can see that on display in Chile. If anyone wants to go there with me, you're welcome to, because uh, I think it would be fantastic to step aboard that ship. Uh, the height of Civil War turret design, the height of uh, actually ironclad design, which will be replaced in the 1880s. By the time this war is over, we're now building what are called protected cruisers and battleships that are made of steel and are featuring different types of guns, steel-made guns. What makes the Pallister shell so good is that at its nose is a section that is chilled iron. And so that's what enables it to break through the iron sides of uh, the whiskar and then the shot then explodes once it gets inside. So that makes these guns, the, the last of Civil War era guns, to step on this ship, you step into the history. Just like when you're here at the Mariner's Museum, we get to look and see and feel the turret of the monitor. Uh, this would be the next best thing to looking at the monitor, in my opinion. So, anyway, uh, I think in honor of Miguel Gaul, uh, we have to uh, recognize that heroism comes in many forms. And the leadership that you share with your uh, crew members and officers are that which will never be forgotten. And no one will ever forget Miguel Gaul. Thank you all. This website here, if you are interested, the interior photographs are beautiful of how they've um, restored it, uh, the wood, the mahogany, the teak. And the it, teak. It, the yeah. teak. But it's really interesting um, if, if you're yeah, prone, British, prone to look. British ironclads were, would have teak backing, mm -hmm. um, which was superior to, like in the south, you used yellow pine and white pine. Uh, and that wooden backing is supposed to have a certain amount of give, but the teak is a stronger wood, and so that makes it... Uh, 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 the British built the best ironclads, I have to say. I like the monitor a lot, but, uh, you know, uh, the central battery frigate is the real answer uh, to uh, warships of that era, the Civil War era. How many men manned those huge... 250. No, the guns. The guns? The, the picture the, the, of the central the, battery. Yeah, uh, this, uh, the 300-pounder Armstrong gun, um, probably about 16. Um, per gun? Per gun. Wow. And it's because of the weight of the shell to move it up, the loading process. Okay. You have to realize a Pallister shell has these little knobs on it so that when you load it, you put it into the grooves. Uh, so that gives it this spin, mm. this powerful spin, and, and the idea is when it hits um, iron, the chilled nub is going to break through, and the shell itself, um, and I could draw you an example of what it looks like, but uh, I should have had a picture of it because it's so neat, uh, but uh, it, uh, in essence, then exploded within the turret mm. in this case. And, and so, yes, now, had it been a pivot gun, there would have been even more men. Mm. A seven-inch brook gun on the CSS Virginia had 16 men because it was a pivot gun, seven-inch brook. Uh, and so you can well imagine these are not pivot guns. Uh, they fall back. The truck falls back on a rail system, and then you are able to uh, load it in, in, in a protected environment. But there is no protected environment when you have a Pallister shell breaking through your turret. And, uh, sounds like a gnarly thing. It's, it's, a bad, mm -hmm. it's a bad day. Sounds like it. Do we have any questions from in the room? Yes, sir, let me bring this to you so everybody can hear you. Yeah, fairly simple question. Is, is the ship uh, equipped, armed, et cetera? today the way it was during the battle. Yes, it is. Now, if you go on the Warrior, 
Those are plastic guns. Plastic? Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, uh, you can go into the monitor center and we have a carronade in there to show an uh, earlier style of gun versus rifled guns and so forth. And it's, it's made of fiberglass. It looks like from here uh, to Olivia, it looks, wow, you know, it's the real thing. And so when I got on the deck of the warrior, I went, oh my gosh, you know, and, uh, you know, it was kind of depressing for me. A letdown, yes. Yes. I, yes. What can I say? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is probably a dumb question. There's no, no question such thing. Dumb. No such thing. Um, you said the two ship kinds of ships were the ironclad and the steel uh, okay steamer yeah made of steel i guess that's what yes 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 and, okay so why you said that I, I hope i heard this right that the steel was faster and uh, whatever so why weren't more ships made of steel was it heavy uh, was it costly uh, number one it's costly Number two, it's the process of making steel that they had not perfected. And so make an iron plate, they could easily do. They could do that in the 1850s. Uh, and so you roll the iron plate uh, and you put it through an annealing furnace and then you actually could shape the iron plate. If you look at the monitor, that's eight layers of one inch iron plate. Now, they could have made eight-inch solid iron plate, but they felt that by laminating it, it gave it greater strength. On the CSS Virginia, and actually the brook guns that are being loaded into the exhibit of the Virginia are also fiberglass, much to my dismay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but you can't get everything you want. You know. I I'll tell you if, you, if you're traveling, you can go down to a place called Fort Branch in North Carolina, um, on the Roanoke River, and they have nine brook guns, their original armament. And what happened is when uh, North Carolina surrendered at the end of uh, the Civil War, they pushed the guns into the river. And so smart uh, guy from Boston says, well, I'm going to get them and I'm going to be able to sell them. So he comes at night, he pulls up the guns, and the sheriff says, thank you for doing that. And so <laughs> they're still on display at Fort Branch. So that's one of my favorite stories. Uh, but steel is a different process, but it has greater strength in rejecting shells. Now, uh, the big thing about naval warfare in the 19th century and early 20th century is that we're developing better forms of armor, but at the same time, we're developing more destructive guns. You know, if you go over and see the Wisconsin, those are 16-inch guns. They're like firing a Volkswagen, okay, uh, <laughs> at the enemy. And, and they are armor-piercing shells. So when you think about, like, uh, the battle in the Denmark Strait between the Bismarck and the HMS Hood, a shell hits a turret and sends a fireball down the cylinder, a coal-style turret, which opens to a long bowling alley, so to speak, where all the uh, gunpowder, sacks of powder, shells are located. So, like, in five seconds, that ship blows up. And so basically we destroy, once we build a certain style of ship, which we think is defensible and really great, what happens is that we make a shell that shows that, well, we can sink that boat with one shell. And uh, so uh, that's why we don't build those ships anymore. You know? <laughs> I wish we still Olivia, made. we have questions online. Uh, John, we have quite a few questions online. Uh, first is from Julian, who is in Chile, about 200 kilometers from Waspa. So uh, their family visits there frequently. Yay. So Julian asks, um, they teach in school there that Waspa had to ram Esmeralda because they couldn't hit it with shells. Is that a myth or true? It's very true. Why they couldn't hit it with shells is number one, uh, the Coles turret on the Waspa 
um, is uh, you can't fire directly forward. So if you're ramming a ship, you, 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 can't, you can't fire at it. Furthermore, uh, the port uh, in... Iquique? In Iquique, <laughs> there you go, uh, uh, was actually controlled by Peru. I mean, by Chile by that time. And it's now part of Chile. And so there were Chileans on shore. And of course, when you're having a battle, naval battle, right off a port, what are you going to do? Everyone goes, looks at it, and says, wow. And so they didn't want to fire. Remember who's in command? Miguel Graw. He does not want to fire directly so that the missed shot that might glide over a central battery ship would explode on the shore and killing his, uh, the Chilean. So uh, that's one of the reasons why he's called the Gentleman of the Seas. Uh, and so they uh, are limited in their gunfire. However, the design of this is so perfectly done because the ram is part of the hull. And they continue making these ram-type ships through 1898 um, and and you look at photographs of them before they get launched and you can see this definite curvature which makes it into a ram but you couldn't use rams after 1890 because I can blow you out of the water before you get to ram me so you know uh, so that was kind of silly but uh, no yes uh, that is not a myth it is the truth Were the shells of Huascar able to pierce the Cochrane's armor? Um, actually, they had elongated shells. In other words, they were more like brook bolts. Um, and they were not as effective as a palister shell. So there is no, uh, the central battery area of like the Admiral Cochrane, um, you know, there's no shell that enters in to that uh, um, section of the ship. Now, as the Esmeralda was a wooden ship, you know, you could ram it all you wanted. You could send an elongated shell. In other words, the Chileans had better ships, better guns, better ammunition than the Peruvians. And that's what gives them victory in this war. We have another question from you mentioned that the entire war hinged on Chilean control of the sea. In your opinion, how much did this war influence Alfred Thayer Mahan? Well, he writes it after this war. Uh, so I think it influenced him a great deal. Uh, I think um, Mahan's theories are easily understood when you look at the Civil War, you look at the Napoleonic Wars. France cannot control the seas, therefore it cannot invade England, uh, and it cannot ensure that supplies can be shipped into France. So uh, control of the seas gives you victory without a doubt. An economic victory, a battlefield victory, and a geopolitical victory. So there is no doubt that uh, uh, Alfred Mahan is influenced uh, uh, by this war and the Civil War and the Napoleonic Wars. So. Thank you for that, John. We have uh, two more questions. These ships needed constant upkeep of their engines. Can you comment on how good the Peruvian engineers were? Well, most of the engineers that served in both the Chilean and Peruvian Navy are people from the United States and Great Britain, believe it or not. Oh. Uh, they understood <laughs> steam engineering, um, Benjamin uh, Franklin, Isherwood, all the engineers in the Union Navy went through all these tests uh, about steam engineering. So um, the engineer on board the Montauk, uh, will, uh, his name is Stevens, uh, second assistant or second assistant engineer uh, was his rank and actually in the US Navy and the British Navy you were an engineer you were a separate rank portion than the guys 
who fired the guns and commanded the ships. So those people kind of look down on those people in the engine room. Uh, but if you don't have your engine working, you, you can't really uh, work your ship. And so there are engine troubles. Um, the Oneida uh, can't leave the dock um, and because of engine problems. You know, Stevens on the Montauk will write that the workmanship is so poor that uh, th he was saying that these big companies are robbing the government by shoddy materials, uh, poorly made iron, and so forth. So actually, uh, John Lomar Worden uh, will make that very clear to uh, uh, the assistant uh, secretary of the Navy, um, Gustafa Vasa Fox, and in this very powerful letter that says, look, these ships can't fight against forts. These ships don't have a rate of fire. These ships' engines are not powerful enough and are poorly built. The big thing is, is the Battle of the Ironclads or Battle of Hampton Roads, wow, Gustafa Vasa Fox was here. He looked and he said, my gosh, that's the answer. And so that's why we built so many daggum monitors. And because, uh, I don't want to lose my job, but your monitor's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've given a lecture about bad monitors before. Uh, and I can go into detail. One more, Olivia. OK, we've got one more. This is our last question from the audience. But we've had a really active chat um, on Zoom today. So we've got a lot of folks from all over here. So Scott asks, wouldn't the USS Cairo be the second oldest ironclad available to see today? It's intact and on display in Vicksburg, even though it's not afloat. Um, I think in the case of the Warrior and the Oscar, they are afloat. Uh, and th that's an entire ship when you look at it. And so that's the difference. Uh, the Cairo um, would be, uh, if, we, if we just use what ships have uh, been saved, the monitor is the oldest, and then comes the Cairo. Uh, and uh, the rest are <coughs> mostly scrapped. Um, you can see the hulls of uh, the CSS Stonewall, the CSS Noose, um, by going uh, to uh, Columbus, Georgia, is where the uh, Stonewall is, and the Noose is in Kinston, North Carolina, which is fabulous. How about the Hunley? The Hunley is not an ironclad. Oh, that's true. Uh, I was just thinking so Although before. it's made of iron boiler plate. Okay. But it's only one inch. I got gotcha. you. Okay, so you know, if you want to ask iron vessels, then mm -hmm. I'd have to yeah, include right. that one. So, but uh, that wasn't the question. That's not a question. My, Michael just comments in the in the chat here. Is there an ironclad afloat in the Netherlands that you're aware of? Not that I've seen. Just curious. Yeah. Um, and I've been to Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Scorpion, he says. Yeah, it would be, oh, that's very pro probable. I have not seen that ship, so I can't attest to it. Julian also shares that the Chilean Navy had to move Wascar to the high seas in the 2010s um, from a tsunami to protect it. Oh, right. wow. That's true. Mm -hmm. And that's when they uh, did another restoration of the ship. Uh, the ship was originally. Uh, restored in the 1930s, uh, and uh, the then, uh, of course, when it was saved from that, uh, that, that hurricane, I guess they would call it there a typhoon or a cyclone. Uh, so it is, there's also a Russian monitor in St. Petersburg, uh, but it is a river ironclad from the 1880s. Um, and it is a float. They just started to restore it. I don't know if they're going to use it in the war against Ukraine or not, but uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, <laughs> they may end up doing that. Uh, so, John, advance your slide to your contact information oh, in case yeah. any of you want to reach John. He he is very good about checking his email and answering questions if you have any that we didn't get to today or that come up. <laughs> 